thank you very much, Steve. And I'm very happy to be here speaking about a topic that I find extremely fascinating and sharing a bit about the um, Queen of Sheba in myth and legend. There's a lot to cover, so I'll get straight to the point and kind of be able to kind of explore a bit some of the many, many rich and fascinating traditions surrounding this ancient queen. So who is the Queen of Sheba? In modern popular imagination, especially in the West, the image of this mysterious queen, this woman, evokes a host of richly potent and yet also somewhat conflicting images. On the one hand, she's imagined as part of a European fantasy of an erotic and exotic East, of great opulence and eroticism, this image of this wonderful queen who comes, meets Solomon, and romances him, and is able to have this very kind of lush, beautiful, both garb and court around her. On the other hand, She's also, within the West and beyond, an exemplar of the ancient African queen, of an idea of black beauty, and especially of the image of blackness in Africa as involved within a biblical past in a way that encompasses very few other figures from the Hebrew Bible or Judaism and Christianity. And uniting both images, especially in modern media, film, opera, and so forth, is this image of the Queen of Sheba as having some sort of special romantic or other type of marital relationship with King Solomon, um, to some extent even depicted worldwide um, from Japan to uh, contemporary films in the, in the United States to Africa um, to Yemen or so forth as being engaged in some type of great love story, some type of great partnership with, with King Solomon. This raises the question, of course, of to what degree any of these images, all of these images, uh, reflect the Queen of Sheba as she was in history, and to what degree they also reflect um, the Queen of Sheba as she is in legend, myth, rewriting, a biblical imagination that goes beyond the biblical past into the Jewish, Christian, and Western, Western cultural imagination. And this is the topic that I'd like to discuss here today, at least to give a bit of a survey in terms of thinking about what we know of the Queen of Sheba, both historically and also as she was received. As we'll see, a lot of the significance and power of the queen goes beyond what we can recover of her historically, what we can recover of her in the 10th century BCE, in the time of Solomon and ancient Israel, um, beyond to raise unexpected traditions, connections, ideas um, that cross a surprisingly global scope. And part of what I find fascinating about the Queen of Sheba as, a, as an image, as a kind of figure who resounds within a fascination and a cultural imagination is that she doesn't just represent a connection to the biblical past, she also represents a, an, an enables a series of connections between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, often in very surprising ways, as we shall see, as well as between Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, and again, often in ways that would surprise us, in ways that we don't necessarily find tracing other figures. To think about the historical Queen of Sheba, we must begin with the Hebrew Bible, which is the earliest place in which we find a reference to her. Um, within the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Old Testament, we find two references to her, the older of which is 1 Kings 10. Um, this tradition is paralleled within two chronicles, um, almost exactly, and is the oldest summary that we have of her, um, and also the one that's closest in time to when this queen may have lived. Um, this summary occurs within the context of the biography of King Solomon, um, who ruled over ancient Israel, the kingdom of ancient Israel, son of King David, in around the 10th, the, the 10th century BC, BCE. The context in which she occurs is the biography of Solomon, but particularly she arises in the context of the end of his life um, in a discussion of international trade. So the involvement of, of Solomon, not just within his kingdom as a, as a king, as a wise king, um, but also his kind of his cosmopolitan, his, his global profile. And this is where we encounter the queen and this, this famous passage in which she, she's mentioned within 1 Kings 10. So within this, this summary where this, um, brief reference to her within the Hebrew Bible. Um, the main features is that she comes because she hears of his fame, 
So we essentially get this, this um, we've been hearing about the perspective of the biography of King Solomon from the perspective of Israel, the king himself. We get this, the, the, the narrative transports us um, to this other land, Sheba, and to the perspective of the queen. And she hears of Solomon's fame and decides to come visit him. So she's given the, 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 the she's the motivation in the story. Um, and what we learn of her next is that the two main features that she possesses that she also highlights about Solomon himself, um, one of which is she's curious about his wisdom, so she comes to test him and to test him with riddles. So it's very explicit in the biblical account that she has this curiosity. She's heard he's wise and her response um, as a woman that's the, who's thus depicted as um, quite significant in her own right is the sense that she has a curiosity of wanting to make sure he's wise and to do so in person through her own questions and through tests of questions. This results in her, Solomon answers all her questions. She's come to visit him in per person to talk to him and she's, her, her, her breath is taken away by the degree of his wisdom. However, this is one element of two that take place within this story. Um, the other reason she's left breathless is that she herself is a queen who comes uh, with great wealth surrounding her, yet when she comes to visit Solomon, the court of Solomon in Jerusalem, um, she is so impressed by the great opulence, the grandeur, both of the palace itself and of the temple that he's built to God in Jerusalem, that she's breathless, she's her breath is taken away. Um, the story doesn't end here. Um, and one of the notable things and one of the reasons why I think the queen becomes such an interesting figure of, of fascination in later memory is that she's also rare among biblical women, given, uh, given not only a perspective of her own, but a voice of her own. So we not only see Solomon through her eyes, she proclaims what's significant about him. And she's seen to be a good witness to this, and in particular stresses his wisdom and his wealth and connects those wisdom and wealth to her inference that it is because of the God of Israel, blessedness through the God of Israel, that he has this wisdom and wealth. Um, as a result, like any monarch would, she gives him um, tribute, she gives him money, gives him uh, more gold, spices, precious stones, um, and this the, the, more than anyone else had done before. So her grandeur is emphasized in part to emphasize his grandeur. Within one kings, the immediate context is again, international trade. So we have no hint of romance, no hint of an affair, no hint of, in, in, in a essence, that the queen, we don't get an image of her as a woman. We get an image of her as a monarch. And it's a very significant detail. She's a formidable monarch who comes with a great deal of wealth as well as a great deal of wisdom and curiosity. And these are all things that make her very unusual in terms of depictions of women in the ancient world in general, within the Hebrew Bible in particular, but um, they're, they're underlined in particular by the, the immediate context of 1 Kings, the biblical account, which is the context of a discussion of trade, which even before we end the story of, of Queen Sheba, um, in the middle, we get, oops, sorry. In the middle of it, we get this, uh, reference to other fleets, other people that have come to Solomon. So it's clear, in other words, that the point of the story is not necessarily about Sheba and Solomon in terms of any kind of romantic relationship, male and female, but essentially she is one prominent example of a, of a royal figure who comes to Solomon, represents his power of international trade, and um, as a result, the conclusion to this is that you know, Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and, and wisdom. The two are paired. This sense, this context, this international trade context, where the Queen of Sheba is more monarch than uh, focused on as a woman, as someone who has beauty or, or other types of features typically associated with the feminine, is also um, the closest thing we know to the historical context of the Queen of Sheba. Um, we do not have um, direct inscriptional or other evidence for her. We don't have any evidence for her outside the Bible from this early period of time. But what we do have is some indirect evidence that shows that this is a plausible story. Um, the plausible story, I mean, the focus of the text itself is on trade. Um, and we know from a um, series of documents as well as inscriptions, South Arabian inscriptions, that there is trade in general between um, Sabai, 
which is probably the, the biblical Sheba in South Arabia, um, upward into both Jerusalem and to the Near East in general. So it's clearly part of a very active trade route. And one inscription, in particular this inscription here, um, speaks specifically of trade between this land and the towns of Judah. So that is the southern portion of Israel, of which the city of Jer Jerusalem is a part. So we do have direct inscriptional evidence that says this context of trade makes sense. It's plausible. We may not know of specific names, specific monarchs, um, specific uh, ideas of this particular queen, but there's no reason to disbelieve the biblical account. Its point that Solomon was richly involved with trade, including with South, South Arabia um, and um, this area of Sheba is plausible from what else we know about the biblical past. Significantly, for our purposes, this biblical account also covers a lot of what we also see within Western art, music, and other types of, kind of cultural production surrounding the Queen of Sheba. Much art surrounding her, for instance, within Western Christian art, uh, Western secular art, um, focuses on her journey and really richly imagines um, the opulence um, of the retinue with which she comes. And this is extending directly from the biblical account and along the same themes of the biblical account, this notion that the wealth of Sheba reflects the wealth of Solomon because if she's wealthy, grand, he is all the more so because she's so impressed by him. Um, this main kind of trope that we find within music as well as in, within art of, of Sheba's arrival, the moment that she comes, um, also the, the moment that's so richly conveyed within the biblical story, which is otherwise quite brief, but does have this moment of breathlessness, this kind of this very, very striking sense that her ruach, her breath left her, like she was just so astonished despite the wealth to which she herself was accustomed. So we find I mean, a large range of iconographical images about this particular moment of meeting, this moment of arrival. And likewise, within the Western artistic tradition, particularly within medieval Christian art from the second century, or from the 12th century rather and following, uh, we find a lot of interest in this moment at which they're having this conversation. And when you see these images, I mean, one of the things that's so striking about them is within Christian art, ancient and medieval Western art, you rarely see these moments of a man and woman just involved in conversation. Um, so you have these very, and in this case, I mean, you, if you look at her face, she's very discerning. And you have this really, you know, very evocative sense of this woman as being someone who's very depicted as intelligent, curious, and as involved primarily with Solomon in an intellectual endeavor, in the sense of this testing, this riddling. She's both worthy to test him, and um, he may meet her test, but it also says a lot about her, that that's what she's doing. What's interesting, then, is also um, what's missing. So we have the sense of the opulence, the sense of its context of trade, the exchange of goods, the sense of riddling intellectual testing and so forth, this interest in wisdom. Um, what we don't have is any sense of a marriage, an affair, a romance. And also within the biblical account, it's not entirely clear how it comes to be that Sheba herself is imagined as African in general and as black in particular. So, for those types of questions, we have to you know, move to the history of interpretation. How is it that these features came to be? How is it that we have a biblical account about this intellectual encounter that becomes later traditions that include some, some element of a love story or romance? And how is it in particular that she becomes such a, a paradigm of an African queen, an ancient African queen? Um, one of the things to note about the biblical account is the biblical account actually quite actively denies there being any sexual relationship in part through the contrast with, for, with Solomon's other foreign wives. His other foreign wives um, are, come in the chapter afterwards and they mislead him to worship other gods. Um, when we look at the account of Sheba in relation to that, what becomes very clear is she, um, by contrast, doesn't pull him to other gods. She acknowledges that his power is the power of the God of Israel. So the account of their kind of sexual relationship not only goes against 
um, the kind of, it's not only something that's not mentioned in the Bible, it actually in, in large part seems to go against the spirit of what the biblical account is drawing up in contrast to the later wives that draw, that draw Solomon astray. This image also of their relationship as being one not of marriage, love, romance, but one of two monarchs who recognize one another in part for their wisdom is also notably what we find within the New Testament. Um, in the New Testament, we find two references to the Queen of Sheba. And in this case, it's this image of the, her as the Queen of the South. She comes from the ends of the earth. And her role is, again, to recognize the one God, the true God, in this case, in relation to an evil generation that doesn't. So just as she recognizes the wisdom of Solomon, so too, according to this, the, the, the saying of Jesus, will she recognize, come back in the end times to recognize the wisdom of him who comes after, who's even wiser, namely Christ. But in both cases, we have the, a, a, a notable striking lack of any sexualization surrounding her, um, and the emphasis is largely on her wisdom. She's wise, she's wealthy, she's a very important monarch. Those are the images that we find. When we turn to the history of interpretation, um, we find two tracks, um, and the interesting things about them is that they both kind of go in quite different directions. So the first track is in relation to the interpretation of Queen Sheba in Judaism and in Islam. So within the earliest Jewish interpretation we find outside the Bible, there is some concern for locating her, and this is the tradition in um, Josephus, a first century Jewish historian. Um, he um, does a large retelling in Greek to a Roman audience of the tale of Sheba, um, just as part of his general history of the Jews from antiquity to the present. And in the course of doing this, he, he, try, he tries to explain essentially her story for a Greek and Roman audience. And in this account, um, interprets her as being a queen of Egypt and Ethiopia. Um, looking at the language of his account, um, he's essentially translating um, the, the geography of the Bible into the geography of Herodotus and other Greek historians. Um, and he also, I mean, he elaborates other elements in terms of making her a philosopher and so forth, as opposed to so more specifically someone who seeks wisdom. The interesting thing about this specification, though, is that it's not the direction in which later Jewish interpretive traditions will go. Within um, Jewish Midrash, so the biblical interpretation, and in a context of rabbinic Judaism, um, in late antiquity and the Middle Ages, the interest in Sheba becomes quite different, and some of it is in this notion of filling these gaps. Um, Jewish biblical interpretation Midrash often fills in a sense what's left unsaid in the Bible, and uh, uh, fills in those, those spaces. And in part, it does so with regard to the story of the Queen of Sheba by asking, what were the riddles? We don't hear of them in the Bible. What did she say? Um, there are a number of traditions surrounding them. Um, but there's kind of one main line in terms of the way that her story is interpreted. It's expanded. The spaces are expanded. The other main way it's interpreted, however, goes well beyond the biblical account to a completely different direction. And in this case, and this is just an example of this, I'm putting the full text up so we can come back to it in questions if anybody's interested, but just to give a general summary, I mean, in one of the Targumim, those Aramaic translations of the Bible, um, that the story is expanded, so it begins not with Sheba deciding to visit Solomon, but the opposite. There's a bird that comes to um, Sheba's court, who belongs to Solomon, reports back to Solomon, and this is why um, Solomon himself sends a letter with the bird for her, for her to come visit him. Um, within these stories, they, these incredibly elaborate legends and accounts um, that um, are striking for the degree to which they don't conform to the Bible itself. So one of the, key, the, the main kind of punchline of the story is that she finally comes to visit him he has um, made this the palace of glass, um, and then she walks along the, the floor of the palace of glass, and she first thinks it's water, so she lifts her skirt, and he can see her legs. Um, her legs are very hairy. <laughs> this is given to be this example. You know, she's obviously a virgin. She's not. She's actually deliberately not um, sexually active, 
which is why she doesn't take care of her, <laughs> doesn't shave her legs. Um, but <laughs> partially this is also connected to the, the essentially the invention of nair, of, of, of hair removal cream. But so um, the point being that it goes well beyond the Bible um, and in this completely different direction, um, which includes a number of details that it's, it's hard to make sense of if we think of it as interpretation expansion of the Bible. Um, the thing that makes it even more interesting in this regard is that these particular traditions that we find within rabbinic midrash, so typically Jewish biblical interpretation, these books that are filled with interpretations of the Bible, um, are incredibly closely related to traditions in the Quran. Um, and there's much debate among scholars which, which traditions come first, how are they related to each other exactly, but for our purposes it suffices to note that this figure, this queen, is in part um, traditions about her served to connect Judaism and Islam and traditions about the, the shared past in somewhat surprising ways. And the, the adoption of a number of these traditions is, is, I mean, is quite striking. So within the Quran itself, within the tradition of, of, of surrounding Sheba, I was made explicit that the whole story goes into effect because the same type of bird, a hoopoe, um, it leaves the court of Solomon, visits the land of Sheba, um, and then comes back to report. Um, so within the Quran itself, as this is mentioned, it's mentioned that the bird reports that she's, her whole people is worshiping the sun, um, and the bird also brings a letter. Um, the tradition is very, it's a very long tradition, very complex, he brings a letter, and um, there's an inter exchange between um, Sheba and Solomon. Um, and the whole theme of the surah at least the portion of the surah surrounding Sheba, is this notion of uh, questions of appearance and reality. So she, um, because of Satan, it says explicitly within the surah, she thinks, and she and her people, think that the sun is God, the sun above, um, whereas actually there's only one God. Um, likewise, Solomon writes to her asking her to come in submission, which is within the Arabic, a pun, um, she could come in submission as a monarch on the one hand, but he's also asking her the same term, is the same root as Islam and Muslim. So this notion, he's asking her to come as a Muslim, so to essentially to convert from polytheism to belief in the one God, which is precisely what happens. And it happens in part because he first of all has a demon come take her throne, bring it to, to his court, change its appearance, and then asks her if she recognizes it. So this kind of sense of this playfulness around appearance and reality with him in this time doing the testing instead of her. Um, and lastly, this moment where he has a court of glass. So his, his palace is of glass. The floor is all glass. She starts to step on it, says, oh, this is glass, draws up her skirts. And then that moment she recognizes, actually, this is not, this is not glass. It's, this is not water, it's glass. And at that moment, she recognizes that all this time she's been misled by appearances in terms of reality, and she converts to Islam. She recognizes uh, Solomon as, as, as a prophet and converts to Islam in the sense of submission to uh, monotheism as opposed to idolatry and polytheism. This, too, is a kind of interesting moment of exchange between Judaism and Christianity because, I mean, this, this tradition, which is otherwise puzzling, within an Islamic context, actually has parallels within late antique Jewish mysticism. So within Hechalot literature, there's this common trope of there being this test, the water test. Um, the mystic who um, ascends to heaven, um, encounters a glass floor that looks like water, and either they say, water, water, um, and haven't recognized the reality of where they are, don't have the, the discernment, to ascend to heaven and then are you know, thrown back down to earth by angels, or they do recognize what it is and go above. So even here, we have this fascinating interchange where in some ways it doesn't quite make sense to ask whether the Jewish or Islamic accounts are first, because what's so striking about them is that these, these traditions surrounding this figure are clearly in some type of conversation. They have a shared horizon on the biblical past, on the shared past, the past of Solomon, the past in which Sheba um, serves to kind of connect um, unexpected areas. This is, uh, connection also continues. 
um, within medieval Islam and medieval Judaism, um, traditions surrounding uh, both iconographical traditions um, and literary traditions around the Queen of Sheba are very rich traditions involving courts of demons. She's given a particular name, Bilkas. Um, she's sometimes said to be the, the daughter of the king of Yemen and a jinn, a demon. So she's a kind of, a, 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 kind of mixed. Sometimes it's said that that's why her legs are so hairy, uh, <laughs> she has demonic uh, blood in her, or at least that that's why um, Solomon wanted to see her legs. Um, in these traditions, some of these traditions, she and Solomon marry, and they, they, they um, um, in some she doesn't, but throughout the traditions, one of her main functions is to underline that he's a prophet, and part of what he does is he brings her to Islam. This a polytheist, someone who worships the sun, he convinces her of the truth of monotheism, the oneness of God. So when she submits to him, she's submitting to him in the sense of, um, of recognizing the reality of monotheism, even in a world in which the sun, moon, and stars seem to have power. This is the same complex of traditions that also informs medieval Jewish, especially legendary literature, such as the alphabet of Ben Sira, um, in which we also find, um, in some cases, she's connected to Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, she's, we have this rich legendary complex surrounding her. Um, in which um, she's associated, especially with the invention of hair removal techniques. <laughs> um, and um, again, things that we wouldn't, couldn't imagine from the biblical account, but are, uh, point to a very distinctive world in which um, we have a shared world of speculation about the biblical past and about these figures. What we don't find within the Jewish and Islamic accounts, however, answers to some of our other kind of main horizons in terms of interpretation, and primarily the association with Africa. She's pretty consistently within those traditions associated with Saba, Sheba, um, in South Arabia, and thus also with Yemen. Um, for these traditions, we have to turn especially back to Christian exegesis and to the image of Ethiopia. So Christian exegesis about Ethiopia and Christian exegesis in Ethiopia. Um, if you recall Flavius Josephus, already in the first century, the Jewish historian had called her the queen of Egypt and Ethiopia. This doesn't get really picked up much within Jewish literature, but it does get picked up a lot within Christian literature. So already in the third century CE, with origin of Alexandria, who lived, uh, a Christian who is from Egypt, um, he's very explicit about the Queen of Sheba being Ethiopian and also being black. He does so especially within his commentary to the Song of Songs, which he reads as an allegory between Christ and the church, but with this image of the allegory between Christ and the church is also a discussion from Solomon representing Christ to a queen, at times Sheba, um, representing the church. For him, this is incredibly important that she's black because, and Ethiopian, because partially it means that she's not Jewish. She's not from Israel. She's foreign. She, she's a type of the inclusion of non-Jewish peoples in the promises to Israel through Christ. So for Origen, she becomes this very important figure. And she also becomes one of the kind of keys to reading um, the Song of Songs in a Christian allegorical manner for it to mean something beyond a sense of why is this love song in the Hebrew Bible? Since this is not, this is a love song between Christ and the church, this is allegorical, and it also speaks to the inclusion of non-Jews by his reading. Um, in the process, um, he really emphasizes precisely what we saw within the biblical account of this wisdom of Sheba, so this notion that she's this woman of extreme discernment. And as a result, we receive one of the most positive um, images of blackness and especially black womanhood that we find within the ancient world, at least within the Western ancient world, within, um, within Christianity. And it's a very kind of striking image where it's very, she becomes very noble, um, intelligent, curious, wise, and these are the features of her that get elevated within this context. It's because of origin and this line of interpretation surrounding the Queen of Sheba as Ethiopian and, and as a symbol of the inclusion of non-Jewish nations to the ends of the earth. 
within the promises to Christianity that we see, also see within much, although not all, Christian art, these images of the Queen of Sheba as black. It's not present within all medieval Christian art, but in much of it, this is one of the images surrounding her. And you know, I just have some images here from you know, stained glass manuscripts um, that some statuary, it's unclear, but at least seems to be that's also what's evoked. But especially from the 12th century on, there's an interest in depicting her in relation to ideas about a wor worldwide mission. And this interest it results in these kind of really strikingly regal images of, of, of blackness, of, the, of her as a black queen. We do find in some manuscripts, in some examples, also the converse. So it's not all positive images. We do find some cases in which um, these illustrations of Sheba do exactly what the Bible doesn't. That is, the Bible contrasts Sheba as wise and so forth with the foreign wives of Solomon um, who draw him astray into idolatry. And we find some examples of that, although strikingly, the more positive examples remain, um, they remain more dominant. So both, both types of imagery exist, as does imagery of a white, a white uh, queen of Sheba. Um, but it's notable that we've, we do find, nevertheless, this very significant imagery of an Ethiopian black Queen of Sheba who's thought of very positively. We might ask, thinking about this, so is this association just an invention? Is this just a sense of people reading Josephus and um, thus coming up with this whole line of interpretation, allegory, exegesis that departs from the historical situation we discussed at the, at the very start? Um, and to think about this, it's actually worthwhile to, to think about geography for a second. So um, Sheba, in biblical times, Sabai, um, is what would, in, in you know, currently, this region in Yemen, which, and within a kind of modern geographical thinking, we tend to, to think in terms of continents, so this kind of Arabian world would be quite different than an African world. We often think in terms of ethnicities, modern senses of ethnicity, where if we think of someone as Arabian, um, Yemenite, or so forth, it would be different from them being African or black. Um, but it's notable that within an ancient context, especially of trade, um, that this, the proximity um, to Ethiopia, especially to ancient Ethiopia, Aksum, is actually remarkable. They're separated by a tiny, um, the smallest point within the Red Sea leading out to the Indian Ocean, um, and their relationships by trade are even tighter. In a world in which the main circulation is by water, um, that these two regions, with Yemen, Biblical Sheba, Aksum, the ancient, late antique, medieval Ethiopia, are actually part of the same cultural domain. So there is some notion of this connection when we think in terms of this um, ancient or medieval concepts of the world and concepts of the connectivity of the world. It's from this tradition within Medi ancient and medieval Ethiopia that we find the richest traditions about the Queen of Sheba, which is the traditions with which I'll conclude in part because they bring together so much of a different horizon, but also encompassing a lot of the traditions we've already seen surrounding her. So within um, Ethiopian Christianity, so native to Ethiopia, um, we find um, a work called the Kebra Nagash, which was put into writing in its present form in the 14th century in Ge'ez, in ancient Ethiopia. So this, uh, this text is this uh, national epic, um, which covers the kind of origins of um, the Ethiopian monarchy, and it does so with an incredibly strong interest and focus on the Queen of Sheba. The text is a bit over 100 chapters, 40 of them are dedicated to the story of Sheba. That's how prominent she is. So if you imagine within the Hebrew Bible, we find this one chapter talking about her. Within the New Testament, we find one, uh, you know, one saying that's repeated twice. Even within the Quran, we have part of a major surah, but it's nothing to this degree. It's really expansive retelling. And significantly for our purposes, this retelling really um, is not just from her perspective, but talks about her importance in a way that goes beyond Solomon's importance. And she's thought of incredibly positively, and a number of traditions are brought in, but with really an emphasis on her. So what happens within the Kebra Nagasht? So here, 
And this is a kind of uh, some of the illustrations of her. She's also this major figure in terms of, of, of imagery, Ethiopian imagery, as being this, this, this figure of this queen. Um, but um, she, within this story, first of all, she chooses of her own accord to visit Solomon. Um, and it's really explicit in this case, she wants wisdom. That's what she's going for. She's wholly motivated by the search for wisdom. She becomes a philosopher queen. Um, she goes to visit him. Um, she, um, there's no sense of her testing or riddling him, but a real sense of them engage in intensive philosophical conversation. There are two philosophers um, engaged with one another in conversation, two monarchs, these two major figures. Um, she is very chaste and she resists Solomon's advances, although he tricks her into having sex with him. And he does this through this elaborate measure where she, he wants her to spend the night in his castle. She's like, this is not a, I'm a chaste woman. This is a bad idea. And he's like, I will, won't take anything from you if you don't take anything from me. She's like, okay, <laughs> sure. Um, then she, she, he, he makes her a meal that's extremely salty. And so in the middle of the night, she gets up and she wants a glass of water. And he was like, well, you can only have a glass of water. <laughs> and she's like, okay, sure. <laughs> um, so she trick, he tricks her. And as a result of this, she has a son, although the interesting thing about this tradition is that she remains a virgin. So she's likened to Mary in this regard. So she remains virginal, but she has a son through Solomon, who then uh, becomes an heir to him. It's said he looks exactly like Solomon. They're identical, except he's black. So there's this image of him as being you know, in countenance, an identical figure, and also a figure who is a second David. Um, so Solomon and Sheba's son, it's a grand figure. He, Solomon wants him to stay. He decides to go back home. Um, when he goes back home, um, a number of courtiers come with him. And one of the things that they do is they bring the Ark of the Covenant. He doesn't know about it at the time, but they bring it. He realizes once it's there in Ethiopia, you know, nothing bad has happened, so it probably belongs here and we'll keep it. <laughs> so as a result, you have this, 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 I mean, this is a very lengthy and beautiful story um, that goes through this kind of epic account of the origins of Ethiopian kingship, does so with an interest in Sheba, Sheba's son, um, and um, also emphasizes, in this case, this sense that the glory of Israel and the promises of Israel actually shifted to Ethiopia and Solomon himself is made to recognize it. So a sense that the importance of Ethiopia thus becomes larger at the end of the story than the importance of Israel and Solomon. Um, for our purposes, one of the things that's interesting about this thus is a sense in which we do find within these Ethiopian traditions um, as a lot of similarities with earlier traditions, a lot of kind of pulling on other traditions about the Queen of Sheba. The points at which it becomes most distinctive, though, is that it recenters the story around her. The story isn't using her to talk about another figure, whether it's to talk about Solomon and Israel, whether it's to talk about um, a, a type of the church, of something that will come after, um, whether it's to talk about um, this pre-Islamic Muslims. Instead, it really becomes about her and about her as being the head of a kingdom and the head of a kingdom that has its own holy sacred lineage that begins with her and is also rooted and rooted in her son, but also rooted in her own wisdom, her chastity, her discernment, and her kind of regal power. Um, which brings us, I mean, essentially to a very interesting point of connectedness where just as we have seen her as a figure, stories about her connecting Judaism and Christianity um, and Islam, so too, um, especially in the traditions in the Kebra Nagasht, she reminds us of the connectivity of Ethiopia, Africa, and so forth within the biblical world, within the world in which Judaism and Islam took shape, and within the world in which Christianity spread. Thank you. <laughs>